Isn't it amazing that something that is invisible can have such power? It reminds me of the words of Jesus where in uh, the third chapter of John's Gospel, Jesus mentions the wind. And he says this, the wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Welcome to Stetchford Baptist Church's online Sunday service. Today we are going to enjoy music that is shared with us from Jeff and Joshua Lee, and then prayers that will be presented by Mary Bliss. And then we are going to look at John's Gospel in chapter 16, where Jesus teaches about the Holy Spirit and his effect in this world. So stay tuned and join us for our online service today. Spirit 
Welcome to our prayers for the Sunday after Pentecost. Some words of scripture from the Gospel of John to take us into our prayer. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own, he will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. The Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. So let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, come upon us. Come around us. Come within us. 
come to lead us, come to guide us, that we may work in your power and rest in your presence. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Father, one God, now and forever. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, giver of all good gifts. Come into our darkness as light. Come as the wind to refresh us and uplift us. Come as joy to disperse our sorrows. Come as power to enable and encourage us. Come as love and revive your church, that we may show and share your gifts, that we may reach out in love through your grace. Come, Holy Spirit, to our world, to areas where there is no peace. We pray for refugees and all war-torn peoples, all who suffer through famine or flood, the world's poor and all who are hungry. Come, Spirit of God, give peace and unity to the nations. Come, renew the face of the earth. Come, Holy Spirit, to our country. We pray for our government and all in positions of authority, for all who make decisions that affect us, especially in times of such uncertainty. Give to them wisdom as they tentatively move us forward with proposed changes to lockdown. We pray for a breakthrough in medical research for all who are working towards a solution to stop the spread of this virus. Father, God, we plead for an end to this pandemic. We pray for the safety of all who continue to risk their lives day by day for others, including all hospital staff, emergency service workers, and all who work in our supermarkets and banks. Come, Holy Spirit, Fill our homes, set our hearts on fire with the warmth of your love. Come, stir our minds and inspire us to do new things. Guide us in our relationships with each other and draw us together in your fellowship of love and joy. We pray for all who feel fearful and close themselves in, for those who are locked in by anxiety for all who are afraid to venture and risk. We pray for families who are suffering from debt and poverty, for families experiencing difficulties in their relationships, for those unable to cope with loneliness and all whose lives are darkened by the fear of death. We pray for all who are seriously ill and those responsible for their care, either at home nursing home or in hospital, for all who are in pain or suffering in any way. Come, Holy Spirit, stir up your power and come among us. Among those known to us who need our prayer, we pray for Eunice, Pedro and the family. Lord Jesus, we ask for your gift of healing for Eunice. We pray for baby Eric, Baby Mackenzie, for Carter and her family, for Bernadette and Colin, for Alan and Warren, for Harold and Sean, for Chris and for Harry. And we continue to pray for protection for those we know who work in the hospitals. We pray for Carl, for Laura Jane and for Lydia. And we remember in our prayers, our older church members unable to join us online. So we pray for Maxie, for Peter, for Daphne and Mrs. Belgrave. We give thanks that you are the God who breathes new life into us. You are the God who heals, restores and refreshes. We give thanks for the hope you give of new life in your kingdom. Give courage and hope to all who are seeking your healing and your peace. We pray for anyone who may have joined our service today for the first time. and We pray that you've met with the Lord Jesus. 
and I invite you actually to say a prayer for yourself or name anyone you'd like to pray for. So in the silence now, we pray for those known only to ourselves who are in need of our prayer. And some more words of Jesus. But when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. We join together now in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And our final prayer. Go and know that the Lord goes with you. Let him lead you each day into the quiet place of your heart where he will speak with you. Know that he loves you and watches over you, that he listens to you in gentle understanding, that he is with you always, wherever you are and however you may feel. And the blessing of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be yours now and forever. Amen. If you have joined us today and you'd like to talk with one of us about the Christian faith or about how to become a Christian, then please do get in contact with us at Stetchford Baptist Church. And the address that you can find us is stetchfordbaptist.org.uk and we'll be in touch with you. So thank you all.
All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes you will remember that I warned you about them. I did not tell you this from the beginning because I was with you, but now I am going to him who sent me. None of you asks me, where are you going? Rather, you are filled with grief because I have said these things. But very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the Advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. When he comes, he will prove the world to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. About sin, because people do not believe in me. About righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And about judgment, because the Prince of this world now stands condemned. I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when He, the Spirit of Truth, comes, He will guide you into all the truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears, and He will tell you what is yet to come. He will glorify me because it is from me that he will receive what he will make known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will receive from me what he will make known to you. We are working our way through several chapters in John's Gospel. John chapters 14 through to chapter 17. And today we're on chapter... 16 verse 1 to 15 this is the farewell discourse of jesus these are words that he spoke to his disciples following the the last supper but before his arrest in the garden of gethsemane these are words that he spoke the night before he was to be crucified and so they're very important words and I said once before that I thought that, that these chapters in particular would be really useful chapters for learning how to be a disciple of Jesus because they are they're foundational things that uh, a believer in Jesus needs to know in, in this world in, in knowing how to survive without Jesus with us. And so that, that was the whole point of why Jesus gave them. He knew that he was going to be leaving this world, and so he wasn't going to be with his disciples any longer. And he was preparing them for that. And so he prepares us as well for that by means of these chapters. In these chapters, one thing that you will see that occurs again and again is references to the Holy Spirit. There are also a lot of references to persecution at the hands of those who are hostile to Jesus Christ. And it's not by accident that these references to persecution are side by side with uh, references to the Holy Spirit. In fact, uh, when you look at chapters 14, 15, and 16, you find that these two concepts come up repeatedly and right in the middle of it all is the, is the uh, chapter 15 where Jesus refers to himself as the true vine and it urges his disciples to, to learn how to remain in him, abide with him, in him. And so it's what it is, it's talking about that relationship with him by means of the Holy Spirit. So these chapters are all about the Holy Spirit and his, his role in our lives so that we may survive as Christians, uh, faithful to our Lord, and continue with him. So this chapter as well, these verses that we're looking at today are all about the Holy Spirit. In fact, if you want to think of it, it there's, there's two things about the Holy Spirit that are said here, two of the, of the works of the Holy Spirit that are crucial. 
The first one is the convicting work of the Holy Spirit towards the world. And the second one is the guiding work of the Holy Spirit in the church. And we'll take these one at a time. First, let's look at the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. We find that mentioned in, cha in chapter 16, verses 8, 9, 10, and 11. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. So in, in talking about the convicting work of the Holy Spirit to the world, Jesus first says, I tell you the truth. It is for your good that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. This counselor is the Holy Spirit. Different Bible translations use different words to describe this title of the Holy Spirit. And here in the New International Version of uh, 1984, you have the word counselor. In other translations, you might find the word advocate, as in a legal sense. And other translations, again, will say comforter, helper. Helper is a really good one. And helper in no way puts the Holy Spirit in the role of a supporter or a, a somehow inferior position or an assistant kind of position. He is our helper. But in the same way that, let's say, for example, if you were a sheep, the shepherd is there to help you help you not get into trouble, help you to feed and to, to, to be taken care of. And so, uh, that, but of course the shepherd is not in any way inferior, then the shepherd is kind of in charge of you, but he's helping you. The same thing is true of, of children with their parents. The parent's role is to help the child to grow up. And of course, the, the parent does that by leading and guiding the child and, and teaching the child. And so we have the Holy Spirit with us as Christians in, the, in very much in the same way as a parent guides his child. And so it's a really good th a title for the Holy Spirit to be called our helper, our counselor, our comforter. And Jesus says to his disciples, on the night before he is betrayed, that Jesus uh, must leave. He, he has to go away in order for the Helper to come. And he certainly will come. And as we know from church history, from our Bible, it, it, it tells us that um, not many days after that, that is within, within 50 days, the Holy Spirit came on the day of Pentecost, as we recorded in Acts chapter 2. And some of the, the things that Jesus speaks of here were fulfilled by means of the Holy Spirit's coming on that day. Right now, he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit's relationship to the world. Yes, the Holy Spirit has a relationship to the world, and it is that, that role of conviction. The Holy Spirit is to convict the world in relationship to three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. And we'll examine these three things one at a time. <laughs> So the Holy Spirit convicts the world in relationship to its sin. It has been said that sin is anything that you think, say, or do that is against God's law. Or anything that you think, say, or do that is displeasing to God. 
And so we could go through the, the Ten Commandments as an example, as a, a way of describing what, what some of those things that are displeasing to God might be. To, you know, not worship any other gods uh, is, is an important thing, according to that, the, the first two commandments of the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20 deal with that. And then there's the, the, the commandment to, to keep the, a day of rest, the Sabbath day, to keep it holy. There's a commandment that talks about honoring your father and your mother. There's a commandment that says, you shall not steal. A commandment that says, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not covet anything that belongs to your neighbor. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And so all of these, these are examples of ways to break God's law. Things that you can do or think or say that are displeasing to God. And you know, every, every place, every society, every culture has its own list of that which is right and wrong. And we codify some of these things that we think are right and wrong into laws. And so there is a morality uh, of a country like the United Kingdom. And uh, the morality may or may not line up with what God says in his word. And so we have our own ideas of what constitutes sin. And in the day in, in which we are living now, uh, a lot of change has taken place in, in terms of what people believe is right and what people believe is wrong. Uh, with, within one generation, there's been huge changes in that, in, in terms of the public perception of what constitutes sin. But the final standard is actually God's standard of what is right and wrong. What, what, what God says is sin is the most important. And this, this is why the Holy Spirit must be uh, doing his ministry of convicting the world of sin. Because even though we have a, a standard of what is right and wrong in our world, it may or may not be true. And the Holy Spirit is to convict the world of sin according to God's definition of sin. Now, the people that Jesus was dealing with in his earthly ministry were, uh, many of them were religious, these religious leaders were, were very devout people, scrupul scrupulously keeping God's law, the commandments. And so they, they had a, their own list of what constituted sin and what was righteous, what was good. So they were very conscious of, of uh, making sure that you, you're a good person and doing good things. And yet Jesus says that the Holy Spirit needs to come and convict of sin. And why is he even necessary in a society that is already religious, that believes in God's word? And that's because even, even though we might have of God's word with us, even though we might be religiously inclined and, and uh, try to do what's right and as far as we understand best, we may or may not have a real understanding of what God does require. In fact, it's quite clear that uh, these religious leaders didn't understand a lot about this, even though they thought they did. There's uh, many other references in John's Gospel to this issue of sin. And um, even, even Jesus was accused of being a sinner by these religious people. And Jesus had once responded to this in John chapter 8, verse 46. He says, Can any of you prove me guilty of sin? And if I'm telling the, the truth, why don't you believe in me? Now that's a really interesting reaction that Jesus gives to the, the leaders and to the Jewish people in, in general. Because here in John chapter 16 and verse 9, uh, Jesus says to his disciples, you know, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to convict the world in re regard to sin because they don't believe in me. And this is, this is still true today. 
all around the world, we, we run into people who don't believe in Jesus. And they need to believe in Jesus. That's the whole point. We, we began uh, in this series in John chapter 14 through 17 with Jesus laying out what is necessary. If you want to get to heaven, you want to get to be with God after you pass from this earthly life, then you have to understand that Jesus is the way to God. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And so it's very important that the, the people in the world, even though, though they might be religious, even though they might have an understanding of right and wrong, they have to be uh, ministered to by the Holy Spirit to understand what God's demands really are, what he, what he says is sin. Because we can blindly go on and believe that we are pretty good, that we're good, that we're good enough, when God, in fact, might have a different opinion of that. And so, you know, if, if you have not had the Holy Spirit's ministry in your life convicting you of sin, of what God's understanding of sin is, then maybe you could pray to God for that and, and, and just open your heart to that. You might think you're a, a good person, religious and everything, maybe not religious, but still good. Well, it's not your opinion about this that really is going to count in the end because God is the judge. So you have to understand what God's opinion is. So Jesus uh, goes on to say in another place, whoever believes, um, actually this is uh, in another place in John's gospel regarding Jesus, it says that whoever believes in him is not condemned. John chapter 3, verse 18. But whoever does not believe in Jesus stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And so from that we understand what sin is really all about. Because Jesus, in coming to this earth, his intention was to come to die for our sins. And so he ministered for those three and a half years and then turned his face toward the cross so he could give his life for the sins of mankind. And he died on the cross for your sins and my sins so that we could be set free and we could be forgiven of our sins. And so it is a um, crucial thing that we believe in Jesus. If we reject the way that God has ordained for our sin problem to be taken care of, then we were re are rejecting our own salvation. So the Holy Spirit comes to convict us in regard to sin because we don't believe in him. This is why he needs to do this convicting work in our hearts and lives. The Holy Spirit wants to expose hidden works that we might even hide from ourselves. We might look good on the outside and we might even convince ourselves that we are good. But God's Spirit needs to come and expose, hold things up to the light so that we can really have an understanding of where we stand and that we actually need God's help. Everyone who does evil hates the light, says John chapter 3, verse 20, and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. And so this is our our need to be exposed, our need to be um, convicted of our sin. Whoever believes in the Son, however, has eternal life. Who, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. So it's not a pleasant thing to talk about sin and being convicted of sin. It's uncomfortable to us all. But it is entirely necessary, just as, as necessary as if we go to a doctor and we, we find out that there's a bad di diagnosis and we need treatment. Perhaps we need even surgery or chemotherapy. Those things aren't pleasant. But of course we're going to do it because we, we want to live. 
And in the same way, we need to open ourselves up to the, the work of the Holy Spirit, cooperate with God so that he can expose to us, show us our sin so that we may have the opportunity to come to this Jesus, our Savior, and put our faith in him, the one who died on the cross for our sins. The second thing that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the world of, according to Jesus in John chapter 16, verses 8 through 11, is righteousness. This is really odd, isn't it? To be convicted of our righteousness. Why do you need to be convicted of your righteousness? What's wrong with our righteousness anyway? Well, you know, the prophet Isaiah, uh, hundreds of years before the birth of Jesus, in, I believe it's chapter 64, he says something really unusual about the righteousness of the Jewish people, of the religious people. And he says, all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Isn't that astounding that good deeds could be considered as as like like a dirty 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 rag that you want to throw out that you know you don't even want to bother cleaning it it's just it's beyond help and there there comes a point in which righteousness needs to be convicted for what it really is as a false righteousness and we all we're all aware of the, this kind of righteousness. It's the kind of thing that we uh, we hate. We, we, we uh, might view it as hypocrisy. We, we, we see an, or an empty righteousness where someone is, is quite righteous in some things, but then has a blind eye to other things. And the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world in regard to its righteousness. When you think about the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they were scrupulous. Uh, the word that I'd like to say, but it's, I stumble over it. They were so careful in, in keeping particular laws that they believed were important. But then there were weightier matters of showing mercy and so on that they, they somehow didn't see the importance of. And of course, the common person would look at this and see this hypocrisy where they were they were nitpicking about minutia little things and yet not really showing the love of god the mercy of god oh they were right they were right in so many ways but they had no heart of care for the souls of people and so there can be such a thing as a false righteousness you could call it a fake good news you could just invite someone, you know, just come and follow me, be like me, and do all these good things, and don't do these bad things, and everything will be okay for you. When in fact, we, we need to understand that this is not the righteousness that God is looking for in us. In fact, Jesus said in one of the other Gospels that to, to his disciples, anybody who wants to be a follower of Jesus, unless your righteousness exceeds that of those religious leaders— you'll never enter heaven. So these religious leaders, Jesus says, are, are not going to enter he heaven because their righteousness is a false righteousness. It's empty of the real spirit of the law. And so the Holy Spirit has a ministry today in this world, a gracious ministry of showing that we are wrong about our ideas of right and wrong. 
And our, our world does have its own ideas of right and wrong. And you know something? In many cases, they do not match up to what God says in his word. And the Holy Spirit is necessary in order for that to happen. So this Holy Spirit is uh, part of what he's trying to do in, in uh, showing us that our righteousness might not be the right, the right kind of righteousness that is required by God. One of the things he'll do because uh, Jesus is no longer here is that he'll, he'll use the word of God to, to show us this beautiful example of righteousness in the life of Jesus himself. And this is why I believe they're viewing, viewing a life, the life of Jesus by way of film and video, the Jesus video or the the, uh, the Lumo Project video, there, there's so many uh, good versions of, of, of films uh, portraying the life of Jesus that if they, they stick close to that which is found in the Bible, you can't help but be really challenged by the example that Jesus gives in his own life. And it's no wonder then that the scripture speaks of Jesus in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, that he's Jesus Christ, the righteous one. And in fact, Paul teaches in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, that Jesus Christ is himself our righteousness. We need him. As, as followers of Jesus, he is our righteousness. Without him, we have nothing. We have right, righteousness before God because of our faith in Jesus Christ, who is the righteous one. And so when Jesus died on the cross, uh, as the scripture says, he who knew no sin became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so there's a great exchange that takes place on the cross of Jesus our sin for his righteousness. He takes our sin upon himself and his righteousness is put in our account so that before God, when we come to God in the name of Jesus, by faith in him, we are viewed as righteous and therefore pleasing to God. All because of what Jesus has done. The Holy Spirit's ministry is to convict the world about righteousness. What is right? How do you get right with God? And what is false righteousness? And so this is a great, a great thing that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. And so there is a life-changing aspect. When you do believe in the Lord Jesus, then it does change your life. As uh, the word says in, in 1 John, verse 2, verse 29, chapter 2, verse 29, if you know that he, that is Jesus, is righteous, you know that everyone who does what is right has been born of him. And so, you know, there is, there is right and wrong. There's good and, and bad things that can be done. There, and there's, there's a righteousness to be pursued as one who has been counted as righteous in God's sight. Um, John goes on to say in, in chapter 3, verse 7 of his first letter, Dear children, do not let anyone lead you astray. He who does what is right is righteous, just as he, that is Jesus, is righteous. So righteous living does go along with being a follower of Jesus. It's you know, we can't just, we don't just totally depend upon Jesus as our righteousness and therefore decide that we can do whatever we want. Because he has given us his life, we are bought, we're, we're purchased at that price to live lives of righteousness and true holiness. And so it's, it's life changing because his life comes into us. The Holy Spirit comes into our lives. And we'll see that in a moment uh, uh, regarding the, the Holy Spirit's ministry in the church. But in 1 John chapter 3, verse 10, it says, 
this. This is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not a child of God, nor is anyone who does not love his brother. These are very strong words, even about loving or not loving your brother or sister in Christ. This is a sign of whether or not you are a child of God. And so if you find you have a difficulty in your relationships with your brother or sister in Christ, it's in your heart to, and it's in your best interest to, to seek to resolve those things. You want to do that, don't you? Because God's love to you has been so great. And so you also want to show that love to your brothers and sisters in Christ, as well as to the entire, the whole world. And so the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of its righteousness and of the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Weather Channel is now responding to reports that one of their reporters was essentially faking it during his coverage of Hurricane Florence. Probably seen the video on Facebook as that reporter struggles to keep his balance. Okay, uh, picking it up here in Wilmington, North Carolina, right at the Intracoastal, and we're in one of these bands. So that's Mike Seidel in Wilmington, North Carolina. But as he braces and fights the wind Friday, check out the two guys who seem to walk right by him in the background there with no trouble at all. The video has been shared more than a million times on social media. So now a spokesperson for the Weather Channel is defending Seidel, saying it's important to note that the two individuals in the background are walking on concrete while Seidel tries to maintain his footing on wet grass. The spokesperson goes on to say Seidel was exhausted after reporting on air until 1 a.m. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit convicts the world in regard to its judgment. We all uh, judge, no matter who you are. We judge each other. We judge that which is right or wrong. We, we often put ourselves in that position and make that decision for ourselves of what we believe is right and wrong. And so we make a judgment. We do that, all of us, whether we're religious people or not, and, the, and people who are entirely not religious, well, they also judge. You know, when we, of course, the most famous verse about uh, judgment is that verse in the gospel that says, judge not that you, you be not judged. And uh, so if people like to throw that up to, as to say, you know, you, you uh, righteous people, you religious people shouldn't be judging us, uh, us non-religious people for, for not being religious or whatever it might be, whatever, whatever the maybe the perceived uh, sin might be, you know, you don't judge me because uh, judge not that you're not judged. And in fact, we all do it. Even the person who says that is making a judgment about that person, about the religious person. And uh, religion doesn't mean anything, does it? It's it's not about religion. It's not about non-religion. It's it's about God, and it's about our relationship with God. And that's that's why the Holy Spirit has been sent into this world to convict the world of it's the way it judges things, and and also to reveal what true ju judgment is about, true justice. And God, there is coming a day when God will judge the hearts of and the thoughts and deeds of, of all people. And he is appointed a day by which in which he will judge all people by his son, to whom he has given all authority to judge, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord. In John's Gospel, the very first time that this word for judgment is used is found in chapter 3, verse 19, and it's closely following on the verse that says, God so loved the world that he became his, gave, gave his only Son, that who, whoever believes in him should not, shall not perish but have eternal life. Well, just a few, a few sentences later in verse 19, we read this. It says, this is the verdict or this is the judgment, it's the same word in the Greek language. Light has come into the world. 
That light, of course, is Jesus, the light of the world. He came into this world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their, e their deeds were evil. And so people like to stay in the dark about what's going on in their lives because they feel ashamed about it if they come into the light and, and those things are exposed. But we must have those things exposed, all of us, if we are going to find hope in the, in the next life. You know, this brings us to a whole other issue about the next life and, and related to judgment and all of that. I remember as a young man when I, when I was a brand new Christian and I was trying, I was happy to share my faith with all of my friends and my co-workers. And there was one young man who, lived, who worked in the same uh, place of employment that I was at. And uh, I, I took the opportunities to share that, you know, you could be saved through Jesus Christ and, and escape the, the judgment that is to come. And he would always say, you know, he, he always called me uh, Padre or Father. And, uh, but he, he would say, you know, uh, that's all right. I, I, I don't, I don't, I want to go to hell anyway. I want to go to, I want to be with the devil and, and with, with, uh, with all the people where the party is going on. You know, and, and I, as I was a young man growing up, I, I heard this, this argument again and again, and kind of a joke, but people would say this, this kind of thing, you know, I, who wants to go to heaven anyway? I'd rather go to where the party's going on. And there's this concept that maybe the devil's in charge of the party. And so we should go and, and enjoy the party there. Just like I'm enjoying, enjoying the party now, I want to enjoy the party then as well. Is that really how things are? And you know, it's a joke, but it, you know what, what? It tries to take the teeth out of the, the, the truth, the reality of that there is a judgment that we're all going to face one day. We're going to stand before the great white throne and be judged by the things that are written about us in, our, in the books, in books that are recording all of the, the works, the things that we have done, both good and evil. And uh, those who will be actually freed from that judgment and exempted are those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And the Lamb, of course, is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, our Lord. If we belong to him, then we will be freed from judgment and we, are, we will be saved. But otherwise, we stand in judgment of God. In, in God's throne, at God's throne, and we will we'll have to face the consequences for all the things that we did and thought and said that were displeasing to Almighty God. The Holy Spirit comes to the world to convict it regarding judgment. And it's regarding judgment because it says the Prince or the ruler of this world stands condemned already. And so we see on the basis of what Jesus says here that the devil himself is condemned. The devil himself will not stand in the judgment. He's not in charge of hell. He is its worst inmate and uh, suffering the greatest punishment because of his, his crimes against God. And so this idea that I can go to be, to, to join in the party that's going on there is, uh, even though it's a joke, it's a cruel, false and twisted dream that somehow I can escape God's judgment by ignoring the issue and just trying to have a good life and forget about everything. We need to understand what, what God's judgment really is all about and that there really is a judgment and that our, our way of judging things, well, it's already stand, it's already, it's already done, it's already finished. Uh, as Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will convict in regard to judgment because the ruler of this world stands condemned already calls Satan the ruler of this world. 
He's the one who's behind all of the hostility towards Christian teaching. He's the one who drives people to, to try to change morality in order to make it line up with what I want to do and what I don't want to be judged for. He is the one who stands condemned already. And if he stands condemned already, then anybody who's trying to, to follow his, his judgment is already facing judgment, going to face judgment themselves. And I say that with sadness because um, I, you know, I, I was in that boat myself and every one of us is. We are, by nature, we've been rebels against God and we've tried to, to, to run things according to our own plans, our own way. But in fact, you know, God has stretched out his hands in mercy and grace to us and holds out his son as our substitute so that we do not need to be judged. Jesus himself was judged on the cross for us. Sin was judged so that you need not be judged. And the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world about, about what it says about judgment, real judgment and real justice is found with God. And we can, we can be on the good side of that. So the Holy Spirit has this work. It's a, it's a wonderful thing that he's doing, even though uh, people don't tend to like it. They, you know, and they get mad at the, the people who might be sharing the good news about Jesus because it challenges, challenges them about their lifestyle about their choices, about what they say they are and they, what they try to make as a part of their identity. It challenges all of these notions because the Holy Spirit has come to, to convict us in regard to sin and real righteousness and the judgment to come. So, listen to the Holy Spirit. This is how a person that comes to faith in Jesus Christ is because the Holy Spirit has, has been at work taking the Word of God and applying it to our hearts and, and exposing our deeds and sh opening up our understanding so that we might no longer be blind to the message of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but understand that there is salvation for me. I can trust in Jesus Christ and be set free. And that invitation is out for today for any one of us who wants to, to find freedom in Jesus Christ. He calls and invites you even right now. Listen to these words from the Gospel of John once again. John chapter 5, verse 24 says, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. And so you can escape the judgment right now by faith in Jesus Christ. If we hear the words of Jesus and listen to, listen to the Father speaking through him, you, you receive eternal life right now and you've crossed over from death, spiritual death, to new life so that you'll not be condemned in the day of judgment. Isn't that good news? It's amazing news. In another place in John chapter 5, it's verse 28 and 29, Jesus says these sobering, sobering words, Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good will rise to live, and those who have done evil will rise to be condemned. But the good news is that if you place your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and the only one who can save you from these things, you will rise to live. Choose to live. Listen to the Word of God. Listen to the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit will come to convict the world in regard to sin and righteousness 
and judgment. Spirit also has a ministry to the church, quite apart from that ministry to the world. And his ministry in the church can be said, summed up in one word, and that is guidance. The Holy Spirit guides the church. When he, the Spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine, and that is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. So the Holy Spirit guides the church. We see that in the life of the, the Apostle John, who, who penned these words, wrote these words, uh, you know, remembering what Jesus said. You know, he, he wrote this gospel around somewhere between 30 and even 60 years after the events occurred. So as he was getting much older, because he was a young man, when he was a very young man, as he was a disciple of Christ. But in his old age, he wrote the gospel of John. After already Matthew, Mark, Luke had been written, after the Acts of the Apostles had been written and was circulating, after also all of the, the, the letters by Paul 
such as Ro the letter to the Romans, 1 and, 1 and 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, his letter to Titus and Philemon, and uh, two letters to Timothy, and then also Peter, what, what he wrote, 1st Peter, 2nd Peter, and then the letter by Jude. Most of this had been written and was already circulating around those early congregations of believers in Jesus Christ. And how did this all come about? It all came about because the Holy Spirit did exactly what Jesus said he would do in relationship to the church, and that, that the Holy Spirit would guide them into all truth. And we already read um, a couple of weeks back how where a, in chapter 14 it it speaks of the holy spirit bringing to to mind all of the things that jesus taught so that those those early disciples the original 12 and the 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 first generation of believers they they were, were used by god to bring about what we now call our new testament it didn't exist when the, when the church began all they had was the Old Testament scriptures and the coming of the Holy Spirit to empower them to share the good news. But little by little, this same Holy Spirit uh, moved in these people so that they would they would write these, these documents down that shared the same message that they were speaking and then sharing it from, with the churches and, and so much so that, you know, eventually we have what we now have in our, our Bible the 27 books of the New Testament, all written and, and uh, gathered there during that those that first generation. And John is in the position now of seeing most of that take place, and he's writing his own gospel. And he is yet, you know, he's also going to be writing his own the letters that he he uh, pens uh, first, second, and third John, and then the the book of Revelation, which is kind of just caps it all off because uh, even as as we read in, in in John chapter 16 see in guiding the the believers into all truth it would say Jesus said that he would the Holy Spirit would would bring to the believers those things that he hears in heaven with the thought from the Father and the Son he will, he will not speak on his own or his own authority. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. And we see that very much the case in the book of Revelation, where the, the future program of God is mapped out there for us, that this is what the Holy Spirit has written. This is what the Holy Spirit has given to the church. And so it is there for our guidance. It's there for our benefit and so it's not something we that is optional. We must, uh, as followers of Jesus, become familiar with it. And yet, otherwise, how will we know what God's will is for our lives? How will we know what the uh, the truth is compared to other ideas that are out there? And there are so many other ideas out there. This is how we we judge truth from error: is by means of His Word this word that was given to us through the Holy Spirit's ministry to the church, to guide the church into all the truth. And so we are, we're blessed in this way. You know, again, this, the Spirit is, is so much uh, like the wind as, as we started out with, because, you know, the Spirit is not visible, neither is the wind visible. You only see the effects of the, each of these things. And it's no wonder then that the world looking on at the church just is uh, confused and doesn't really understand, well, you know, who's really in charge of this, this institution? And how is it that there's so many different kinds of churches and yet they can, they can also agree on, on the main things about things? And, the, you know, why isn't it there's so many, why is there not a multitude of different kinds of Christianity that is 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 different in in huge huge ways. I mean, most of the differences that we do see are really you can chalk it up mostly to culture and history. It's uh, the beliefs at the core are 
in the main are the same. And that's, that's the exciting thing, is because the Holy Spirit is the one who's doing the guiding into all truth. And it, this is the same Holy Spirit where it says in back in John chapter 14, the world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. And he is in us. If you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit comes into your life. And so, by means of the Holy Spirit, Jesus himself is with you. And it's the Holy Spirit that then uses each believer and collectively the Church of Jesus Christ to share this good news around the world. And it's by means of the Holy Spirit using the Church that a lot of this convicting work towards the world takes place by means of their evangelism and by means of missions to the people outside of the church so that they get the opportunity to hear what God says about about these these issues about sin and righteousness and judgment they get to hear the good news that Jesus Christ has died for our sins and that he is the way to righteousness before God and he is the one to whom we will all answer one day in the day of judgment. And so Jesus is the one who saves us. And so this is a uh, the, the blessing that we have in having the Holy Spirit in, in the church it's because he is he's there uh, to use us in his worldwide mission. It says in, in John chapter 15, verse 26, which uh, Pastor Jeff looked at last week, was that when the, when the Holy Spirit comes, this Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, says Jesus. And it's, it's not surprising then in the very next verse that Jesus says, you also will testify about me. You know, it's, it's hand in hand. The Holy Spirit works through the church to spread this good news about Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit guides the church into truth and then moves in the, that church to, to share that truth to the world outside. Because this is a, wor a message worth sharing. Those of us who have embraced the message and welcomed Jesus Christ into our own lives, we know that this is a message worth sharing. And sometimes we're, because there is that hostility and this uncomfortableness about being having our, our basic assumptions about life and about what's right and wrong being challenged, we, 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 tend, we can shy away and we forget that, you know, the Holy Spirit can also give us boldness so that we will share because it's for their benefit that we share. It's not so much about our comfort. It's so that people might find life. Uh, just as we have found life and find forgiveness. So it's, it's there for us all to, to enjoy from the hand of the Lord. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ, then thank God for his Holy Spirit at work in your life and cooperate with the Holy Spirit. Uh, be free in your, in your heart to, for him to give you that boldness and, and encouragement to share your testimony with those on the outside who need the Holy Spirit's ministry in their lives, uh, convicting them of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God can use you. You, you. you never know what kind of a word uh, you're going to say that you, without even knowing it, 
something you can say that will, will be a blessing to somebody because it, it shows them that they need to put their faith in Jesus Christ, just as you had to. And if, if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus Christ, this is a beautiful opportunity for you today to just bow the knee before the Lord in your heart and say, oh, Lord Jesus, thank you that you died for me. You died for my sins. And thank you that I, before God, I can be righteous. I can be considered good enough because of what you did on the cross, dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you that I don't have to fear judgment when I'm safe in your hands. Oh, Lord, save me and help me as I seek to follow you from this day forward. I pray. Amen. Well, may God bless you this week as you seek to cooperate with the Holy Spirit in your life. Amen. In this song that we're going to play for you, Psalm 23, just expresses a, a prayer to the Lord that he is just that reminder that he's with us and he's, he's not left us, that he's there with us. And maybe you're struggling this week with some challenges, some difficulties, and uh, just sing along with us. Just be reminded of this song that God is with us this week, no matter what you're going through. Thank you for being with us today and i'd just like to say one more thing and that is you know during the these these times these difficult times with covid 19 all around us and you know not being able to meet together as a church the I, you may, may or may not be aware that these are challenging times for for congregations like ours 
because uh, you know we're often we're accustomed to gathering on Sunday and being able to put money in the plate and to help pay for the expenses and to to see God's work done in various ways in the community and around the world. But the expenses continue, and uh, so if you would like to give uh, to the ministry of the church, you ha you have the opportunity to do so by means of direct debit and you can uh, you know I'm not going to put put out the sort code and bank account uh, in this video but if you'd like to give towards the needs of the church it would be gratefully accepted and a big help to to us all so uh, you can do so by going to the church's website as you'll see um, there are available for you at stetchfordbaptist.org.uk and just making contact and I'll be the one that would receive the email uh, where you you would, uh, express your interest in in knowing the sort code and bank account so we can we can I'll supply that to you and um, be happy to uh, show you the way in which you can share uh, whether it's a one-time gift or you want to give on an ongoing basis that that's entirely up to you but so thank you so much for considering this. And thank you for being with us today. May God bless each and every one of us this coming week as we live our lives in the new normal.